the while I'm not a repair shop, I do occasional repairs for uh, my local ham radio friends. So on the bench today is uh, the battleship of a transceiver here, the legendary Yaesu FT-1000. Um, now this one, uh, my friend said that the receiver died on it. So uh, let me walk you through uh, kind of a review of my uh, debug process here, and we'll see if we can get this rig repaired. All right, so we've got the rig on the bench, got the uh, the top and the uh, bottom covers removed, and uh, we've verified that the rig is not stuck in transmit or anything like that. So we powered it on into a dummy load, just to be sure it comes up in essentially receive mode, so we don't accidentally transmit something into my signal generator. All right, so we've got the rig turned on here, listening in 40 meters. We turn the volume up. Sounds like we've got static, so the receiver's not like stone cold dead quiet, so that's a, that's a good thing. Maybe the audio circuits are all working okay. Uh, see, we've got it tuned to 7.2 megahertz, uh, listening lower sideband. So let's inject a signal at uh, 7.199 megahertz. Uh, so it'll be 1 kilohertz below, so we'll have a 1 kilohertz tone in the receiver. And set the amplitude to minus 73 dBm. If everything's working correctly, then this should result in an S9 output on the or S9 or the receiver or so. And if we take a look, the S meter is didn't move, but we can hear a slight tone. Let me turn the signal generator off. Went away, back on. So there is some signal getting through. So the receiver is not completely dead. It is converting. So that's all good news. Let's see what it takes to actually get an S9 signal. All right, so there we have something just to, just a little bit above S9 on the meter, and we take a look at the signal generator. We're all the way up at uh, minus 22 dBm, so it's about 50 dB larger signal than there needs to be normally to get an S9. So the signal is obviously greatly attenuated uh, going through the receiver path. Now the one thing I want to do is take a look and see if that 50 dB or so of attenuation is band dependent or frequency dependent. Now the reason we want to do this is twofold. If we find that the amount of signal level it takes to get to S9 varies you know, kind of gradually from you know, one end of the frequency range of the radio to the other, say from 1.6 megahertz up to 30 megahertz, it varies kind of gradually that may tell us that the fault is maybe some kind of a break that is causing a small, you know, like uh, in series capacitor that uh, maybe at high frequencies isn't attenuating as much as it is at low frequencies. Uh, the other thing it might tell us is if we find that there's a dramatic difference in the signal level that uh, results in S9 on a band by band basis, it may tell us that there's a problem in the uh, the pre-selection bandpass filters that uh, exist between the antenna connector and the front end of the radio. Uh, but if the amount of signal it takes to get to S9 is the same across the whole frequency range of the receiver, then that tells us that the loss or attenuation that we're getting is somewhere within the circuit where it's not frequency dependent at all. So that'll all help us narrow down where the problem is. Now, let's see, the, uh, at the same uh, minus 22 dBm we're getting about an S7, S8 signal level here, so slightly frequency dependent at the lowest uh, frequency band, of amateur radio band anyway. Let's work our way up and see what it looks like going the other way. Let's see, at uh, the 3.5 megahertz, uh, that same minus 22 BM, dBm is giving me uh, S9. About the same at 10 megahertz. You know, and about the same on 14.2 uh, uh, megahertz. And I walk through the rest of the bands for uh, 18, 21, 24 and a half, and now uh, 28 megahertz, all about the same. So no real change, no dramatic change in uh, the amount of signal required to reach S9. So that tells us that the uh, problem I have in the receiver is not necessarily in a particular filter or a frequency selective portion of the circuit, but the loss is kind of consistent across the, uh, the entire frequency band. So that kind of helps us uh, track down where the problem might be. All right, so let's trace the overall RF path uh, through the transceiver here to understand uh, what's going to be frequency dependent and what paths are not. Uh, so coming from the uh, antenna port on the back, we're going through the little SWR sense board here, and then up into uh, this uh, unit here. This is the low pass filter unit that's typically uh, in line for transmit, for the transmit low pass filters but there is a path from the antenna port here 
to another line going out to the RF board. There's a little relay that disconnects the antenna from the receiver when we're in transmit mode. So we'll have to go through that path here first. And then this coax runs back through the receiver into the back. All right, that coax comes out uh, into the bottom of the receiver here uh, into this unit right here, which is the RF unit. Uh, the RF unit underneath this can houses a bunch of uh, pre-selection or bandpass filters for the various bands. Uh, so the signal comes in here, goes through a little bit of switching and filtering. Uh, there's some pin diode switches and things like that here. Then we go into the bandpass filters, and we don't think there's a problem with any of those because we're seeing the same response regardless of the band we're on. And then after we, after we come out of the filter, we go in through essentially the first stage of mixing. Uh, once we come out of here uh, and go into the mixing, then everything from here on in, in through the IF path and everything else, is going to be at a, uh, a fixed frequency regardless of what frequency we're operating at. So uh, that, that's also a common path. So uh, I like to kind of go back and see if we can kind of draw a line maybe at this point here before we get into the IF, you know, maybe before the first mixer, and see if I put a signal in here. Uh, do we get a good signal uh, in the receiver, meaning that from here through the IF path we're okay, and the problem is on the other side of this between here and the antenna, or if we inject a signal here and we don't get a good response, and that tells us that our problem is somewhere in the IF path and the processing throughout the rest of the receiver. Now here's a portion of the schematic of the, uh, that uh, RF board. Uh, the RF uh, receive signal antenna comes in here, that's the coax I showed you in the corner of the uh, bottom of the uh, receiver. It goes in through a couple of relays, there's uh, some pin diode switching here, a bandpass filter, and then we go into um, this set of uh, band-specific bandpass filters, like the pre-selection filters. And then after all of that, we go through another uh, IF transformer, some more pin diode switching, before we get into essentially the, the first mixer. So what I want to do is come in here and inject a signal at this point here. All right, so those diodes we're looking for are uh, D1044, D1045. And if we look at the board layout, um, that's uh, those two diodes are sitting right here and they're kind of mounted on end so I should be able to get to one end of those to kind of just touch a probe to to inject a signal and see what we have. Okay those two diodes that we're interested in are uh, let's see, located right here on the RF board and they're right right there and in fact those are the two cathodes so I should be easy to go and touch uh, there with my probe. What I'm going to use is just a little, this little homebrew contraption here it basically is a piece of uh, 50 ohm coax with a uh, probe set out of the, end, the tip at the end and a ground clip over here. And that just comes off into an SMA connector. Now what I want to do is uh, add a, uh, a DC block. That's what this guy is here. And it's just a, uh, a series capacitor to ensure that if there is any DC on that signal, it doesn't get fed back into my signal generator, which is connected to the other end. Now I've adjusted the signal generator to uh, minus 73 dBm. Now that's not exactly what we're going to be getting at the probe tip here because we're not terminating into 50 ohms, but it ought to be close enough that uh, you know if we're going to get uh, something close to a, an S9 signal level, we'll get that. Um, and certainly it'd be obvious if we're 50 dB off. So let's see what we get. Now the reason we can apply minus 73 dBm to this point in the circuit is that because between here and the connector on the back of the rig there aren't any active circuits, no amplifiers. The only thing that we've got between here and there are some relays, uh, some pin diode switches, some filters, some coupling transformers and coupling components. So <clears throat> under normal circumstances the loss between the, uh, the rear panel connector and this point here should be relatively small. So we should have about the same signal level. Now it's not going to be exactly the same because the circuit impedance is going to be a little bit different and there are going to be some losses along the way. But there isn't any gain or amplification along the way here, so I think we're, we're safe applying that same minus 73 dBm at this point in the circuit to check out uh, from the IF stage through the rest of the receiver. Okay, ground clip is connected. Let's touch the, uh, the diode here. Oh, that's very encouraging. That's minus 73 dBm being applied just at the tail end of this uh, set of bandpass filters, and that looks pretty good. Let's take a look what's going on on the S-meter. Okay, let's reach in here and touch those diodes again. Uh, look at that. Uh, get basically right at an S9 signal level. 
exactly what we ought to have. So that tells us that the um, the mixing stage, all the IFs, all that kind of stuff seems to be working just fine and the problem is somewhere between um, that point and the antenna connector. So let's start working our way backwards. Okay, let's, uh, let's jump over the other side uh, of the uh, RF board and see if we can eliminate the RF board entirely. Um, you know, I typically like to look around where things are going on with switching diodes because things like pin diodes and switching diodes can oftentimes be points of failure. And there's a couple uh, of them right, right here uh, ahead of this uh, uh, coupling transformer uh, going into the bank of filters. There's also another couple of switching diodes here. So let's just bite the bullet and go all the way into uh, the input connector here and put a signal in here because if we get that same S9 signal level here then we've kind of eliminated all of this as being a potential problem. So this is where that uh, receive antenna uh, signal comes in to this board. So let's pop it out here and I'll inject the signal right into uh, that connector. All right, got my probe ready to go in there. And that sounds pretty good. Let me take a quick look at the S meter. Yeah, and then we've got our S9 signal there as well. So we've eliminated the entire uh, uh, RF board as a potential source of the problem. So uh, we're kind of zeroing in. There isn't too much between that board and the antenna connector. Right, so let's see how the receiver gets its signal from the antenna uh, when it goes through this low-pass filter unit. Now the low-pass filter unit has got all these low-pass filters that are used only in transmit mode. Uh, in the receive mode, uh, the signal basically comes in through the antenna port and out through the RX port here. So here's a zoom in on that portion of the schematic. Our antenna comes in here and uh, normally in receive mode we go through this uh, a relay. The relay contact would be closed and then we go in through this pi filter and out to RX out. This is that coax that runs off to the RF unit that we just tested. So um, there's not a whole lot that can go wrong here. There could be a problem with the relay there could be, you know, that it would be open when we're in receive mode, so we'll check the switching voltages to see what that looks like. Uh, there was also uh, this transient device here, which could be shorted. One of these, one or both of these caps could be shorted. The inductor could be open. So those are the only things that could really go wrong, but in this path, that would attenuate the signal from the antenna to the output to the rest of the receiver. All right, so let's, uh, let's pop the cover off of this... Uh, uh, low pass filter unit so we can see what's going on inside uh, between transmit and receive mode. Now let's test things that are easy to get to first. Um, let's first check to see if the relay coil is getting properly switched between transmit and receive mode. That's controlled by this transistor here and a couple of signals off of uh, one of the connectors over here. So let's make sure we got the proper switching signals uh, available to us and that the voltage across the relay is being turned on and off. Okay, this is the uh, relay in question, and this is the switching transistor. That's pretty easy to get to. And then this, there's a couple of leads on this connector here that provide us with the 13 volts, uh, you know, supply voltage and the, the transmit switching signal. Now I'm going to be switching the rig between transmit and receive. And even though I'm in single sideband mode with no microphone connected, just to be safe, I'm hooking up the... Uh, output of the radio into a dummy load just in case there's any power being transmitted at all. So uh, let's take a look at uh, our voltages. Uh, so our 13 volt uh, supply to the circuit should be right here and that's you know 13 and a half volts so that's okay. Uh, this voltage here is reading about uh, 2 millivolts. If I switch to transmit mode it jumps up to 4.2 and then goes back to uh, zero volts. So we have our proper control voltage for switching. Let's see if that transistor is doing what it ought to do. So the collector of that transistor is uh, right down under here. And we can see that's sitting at, uh, in receive mode at 13.38 volts, so that should be enough to turn the relay on. We go to transmit mode, drops down to just 15 millivolts. So we are getting the proper switching voltage uh, at that relay. Uh, however, as I switch between transmit and receive, I can't hear that relay clicking at all. Now some relays are actually very quiet and uh, sometimes you can feel them and I don't feel that relay switching. So I suspect that that relay itself is, uh, is faulty and that it's just not switching uh, when we turn the coil on. But let's do one uh, test to be sure. So now I've uh, 
gone in here and just tacked a little jumper wire across the contacts uh, for the relay. And uh, let's uh, hook up the receive signal path and inject our minus 73 dBm signal in through the connector on the back of the transceiver and see if the receiver behaves normally. Moment of truth. Let's turn on the output from the signal generator. There we go. Got our uh, S9 signal. Let me turn the volume down here. So we got our S sign signal at minus 73 dBm coming right in through the normal antenna connector. And all we had to do was uh, jumper the contacts for that uh, relay on the low pass filter board. So I think it's time to uh, uh, take a look and see what that part number is and uh, order that part. Right, according to the schematic and actually the part number printed on the uh, relay itself, it's a TC-112NV. It's the manufacturer's part number. And looking in the, uh, the service manual for the uh, FT-1000, it's a Yesu model, uh, part number uh, M1190104. So I'm going to order that part up from Yesu, and uh, hopefully when that part comes in, we'll replace this relay and uh, get the radio all back up and running. All right, through the magic of video, uh, here we go. We have the replacement part from Yesu uh, to replace this faulty relay. So all we need to do is uh, pull this uh, low-pass filter board out. And that's just a matter of removing uh, these four coaxial connections. They just pull out uh, actually five coaxial connections. And then uh, one, two, three uh, multi-pin connectors. And there's four screws and the whole board comes out. And some quick work with my vacuum desoldering tool. Should be able to get this uh, relay out of here. And we'll insert the new relay into the board. And for the first pin or two, I'll keep my finger under the board to uh, hold the part in place until the uh, solder can hold it in there for me. And we'll clean off the solder flux with a little isopropyl to make them nice and clean. And we'll reinstall the board. And reinstall all of the connectors. And before I button it back up, we'll do a quick little test run here. Turn the rig back on. Uh, we're tuned again to 7.2 megahertz. Now let's turn the signal generator on at minus 73 dBm. And boom, we've got our uh, S9 a little bit higher than S9 signal. 160 meter band, we look okay. And the 80 meter band, we look okay. And I ran through the rest of the bands and up here at uh, 10 meters, uh, we're looking okay as well with a minus 73 dBm input. So it looks like that relay fixed the problem. Let's button the radio all the way back up again. We'll start with the bottom cover and then its screws. And after flipping this tank over, we can uh, put the top cover back on here. All right, got the radio up here in the shack, just checking out the receiver. Looks like it's uh, working normally here on uh, 40 meters and checked out the other bands here as well. Uh, signal levels, uh, and comparing between my, that and my 870 look uh, pretty comparable. So uh, I think that relay was it. And uh, thanks for watching the repair. If you liked what you see, give me a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed already, please do so. And uh, thanks again as always for watching. And we'll see you again next time.